there's so much sterility in modern life. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you start messing around in the kitchen, making medicine or making your body care, everywhere gets a bit messy. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's still clean, but there's a mess, which is a glorious mess because you're creating something. Yeah. And I think women, we are natural creators. And, um, and even if people don't have their own children, you can garden and that brings something to life or you can make something and it comes to life. Your idea comes to life. So I think the more creative we can be is another way of getting back to maybe not a cyclical type of living, but a curvaceous mm. type of living. When you have your peaks and troughs of creativity, mm. it's that curvaceous aspect of life, which is again, like the earth, our earth mother is curvaceous. Hello everyone and welcome to the Cyclical Living Podcast, a podcast that will inspire and empower you to live your full, cyclical, soulful life. I am Sara Dusilara, founder of the Wild Rose Mystery School, a place dedicated to reawakening the wild, cyclical ways of our earth, body and soul. Enjoy this episode, my love. Teddy Conroy of Danu's Irish Herb Garden is a teacher, herbalist, and kinesiologist. She has named her garden after the Irish mother goddess Danu. Danu's Irish Herb Garden is a garden of healing, magic, plant wisdom, herbal medicine, and practical living. Terry combines her love for teaching and plants and shares her knowledge via her herbal medicine courses, the Wise Woman Way training, and in-person retreats. She also has an amazing YouTube channel where you can learn all about the herbal medicine making, gardening, and the Wise Woman Way. Terry believes that herbal medicine is a radical way to personal empowerment and health on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Working with plants also enables us to connect more closely with the planet, our Mother Earth, en route to good health. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this brand new episode of the Cyclical Living Podcast. And today's guest is Terry Conroy. Terry is an amazing person. She lives in Ireland. Um, and yeah, she is just, I, I'm so inspired by her work and especially her YouTube channel where she teaches us the amazing wonders of the wise woman path and earth-based living. And so of course I wanted to, to invite her on the cyclical living podcast because Terry is one of these people that just completely embodies the cyclical living path. So welcome Teddy to the podcast. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's always good to talk about these things. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a fascinating subject and I just can't get enough of that. <laughs> so yeah. I'm happy that you feel the same. Um, yeah, my first question to open up the conversation is always um, what cyclical living means to you. So if you could just speak to us about what you feel cyclical living is and what you understand and how you embody that in your life. Okay. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I was preparing for the podcast and I think it's something that changes. Um, basically, I would just observe the seasons and follow the seasons in their cycle. And in Ireland, um, in our ancient past, we would have had eight. Well, we would have had the four um, main fire festivals, which would be the solstices and the equinoxes. But then we have what are called cross-quarter days. So we have Imbolc, which is just coming up. And then we have Bieltana and Lunasa and Samhain. These are the cross-quarter days. And so we move around the wheel of the year, which in a way reflects the wheel of man as we move from birth to death. Mm -hmm. We go from birth to childhood to becoming a young person to becoming a parent, to becoming an older person, and then we approach death. And then the cycle begins again. So it's very much about life, death, rebirth. Um, there is no end because it's a cycle that spirals. So when it gets back to the beginning, it takes off again and makes a new circle. 
And so I think for me personally, I just observe the seasons and I observe those um, festivals. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, same also working with the Celtic Blue of the Year. It is mm. such a easy way to bring cyclical living into our lives. Well, it, it is already it's already there, but it's about it's giving that really nice um, structure to our mind to live through what our body and our natural state just does. And could you speak a little bit also on how you actively engage with them? Because as you are a gardener, maybe, you, well, for people who don't know you yet, can you speak a little bit about that work that you're doing and how also with your work in the garden and creating medicine, um, yeah. that is also very seasonal. Well, it's very cyclical as well. Um, I think being somebody who grows my own food and medicine um it's um it all, all through the year all through the cycles of the year the seasons of the year it's an excite it's exciting because we're coming up to spring sowing and um, we have a very mild climate here on the west coast of ireland so i can sow seeds in february and i have a little hot box um so i start sowing seeds around february and um so the seeds are sown and then they begin to grow and then we pop them on. So again, you know, we put children into nurseries, but we've also got our little plant nursery because as these little seedlings grow, they become like children. And I feel very protective towards them. And um, I kind of mother them until they grow a bit bigger. And then I pop them on and then I harden them off and I put them outside and then I plant them outside. And then they grow and I look after them when they're growing and then I harvest them and I harvest, I uh, collect seeds as well. So again, it's another way of ensuring that that cycle of life continues. And um, I think just observing even the weather changes, you know, we have a very temperate climate, so it's pretty much green all the time. It's moist. It's a very moist climate. Um, we do get hot days in the summer as well. We do get an odd little bit of frost, but um, the weather changes are not hugely, there isn't a huge difference really apart from temperature. But it's the birds coming back. It's the insects coming back. You know, you can see, you know you're at a certain cycle of the year, a certain season of the cycle of the year when you begin to see different birds and insects and animals. Mm. Yeah. So if you're gardening, do you also, um, would you be inspired then if a certain type of bird comes along, would you then be like, oh, it's time to do this. It's time to do that. Is that how you link it? Or is it more just being aware of how the season truly manifests in day-to-day -to -day life? I, I wouldn't be um, particularly knowledgeable about different birds obviously we have the cuckoo that comes it always arrives the same week in april because oh. i've kept i've kept a record of that so it's always the third week in april that the cuckoo arrives so once you hear the cuckoo it just lifts everybody's spirits because yeah. you know that summer is on the way yeah and then you know we do see the birds nesting and we tend to get a little nest here above the front door um what are they that go in there i think they're little starlings and then, of course, the swallows come up from the south. So, yes, you would notice those things. And then again, when they're all leaving in autumn, um, the starlings um, and, and, the, and the swallows, they kind of go crazy, swooping and diving and moving through the skies until they just one day they're just gone. Mm. Yeah. Mm hmm. And um, I was wondering when you were speaking there and how you're so intimately working in the garden and with the seasons and the cycle of the season, was this always the way that you lived or do you have, um, do you come from the city or where you were born into that kind of uh, farm life as well? Because when we're growing our own food, we're farmers um, yeah, in yeah. essence. Yeah. No, what happened to me is, um, my family emigrated from Ireland to England. And so I was born over there in a very industrial town. Oh, they, in the past, they had be, there had been shipbuilding, there was iron and steel works, very much a manufacturing and uh, chemical, chemical production area. So there was some lovely countryside, but I lived in the town and I yearned 
for nature. And um, we would come back here to Connemara on holidays. And we, in when I was a child, you were just put outside the door and off you went for the day. And we could roam and roam. And we have the seashore and we have the hills and we have the fields. So as a child, it made such an impression on me. It was just like being in paradise. And I loved, I just loved it so much that I always intended to come back home to Ireland. Mm. And as the years went on, um, my plan to come back was becoming nearer and nearer. Because first of all, I said, when I retire, and then I said, hmm, maybe when the children are grown up. And then I thought, maybe let's go now when the children are small. So we came back to Ireland when the children were still little little ones. Mm. And um, so half my life has been here now. And um, it's just wonderful to be in a place where you can immerse yourself into the natural world just by observing or by growing, um, observing the plants, different plants coming up at different times. You know what time of year it is when you see X or Y plant coming up in the wild. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and definitely also uh, through following your YouTube channel, um, we get to intimately see also the surroundings where you live, your garden, and that movement through the seasons. Because personally, I love that about your YouTube channel that is very um, linked in with the Celtic Wheel of the Year. And that you actively take us with you on your journey, um, whether that is in your garden or outside on your walks with your dogs. And you just yeah. talk about all these different plants. The last, maybe you can speak about that one. The last post that you made was about the bramble um, and their um, role also in the placing of um, boundaries, mm. the blackberry. Yeah. Black yeah, bramble. Black. We in, in Dutch we call it the brambles, but I, what was it again in English? Well, it's it's both the bramble or it's the blackberry because yeah. it produces blackberries in from August onwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah the brambles. They're um, they're associated with the goddess Bridget. Um, so this is the time of year. That's why I put the post up because I was observing. They're very noticeable now because there's no leaves. Mm -hmm. So you can see the intertwining of these um, very long runners that they put out very, very thorny. So they're a brilliant boundary because you can't get through them because they're so thorny. Sometimes they have really big thorns, almost as big as your thumb. And other times they're just like little needles. And um, But again, they're multipurpose because they create these beautiful boundaries. So they're protective. And they also provide medicine through their leaves and berries. So the leaves are a wonderful astringent. They're very good if you had um, dysentery or loose bowels. But the fruit then is very, very high in antioxidants and vitamin C. So it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful medicine to collect to make something like an oxymel or mm -hmm. some winter remedy that will help you yeah. um, get through all the germs of winter, the flus and colds. Yeah, beautiful. Could you uh, explain what an oxymel is? Because I work with that as well, but I feel like the listeners won't all know what an oxymel okay. is. And um, these are these basic ancient ways that we use to prepare our food and our medicine, um, which I also really would love to dive in with you on all okay. these ways. Yeah, because they're so easy, but they're so emp empowering and important. Oh, yeah. I mean, um, well, an oxymel combines three things honey which is a natural antibiotic and has lots of wonderful enzymes that really support your health and it's very good for digestion it's just an all-around good guy then vinegar apple cider vinegar again it's a natural antibiotic and again it supports your health in many ways it breaks down fat eases inflammation in the body so you take your blackberries or you could use any fruit you could use elderberry and um as I said, the blackberry is full of vitamin C and other antioxidants. So it's going to protect your immune system. And um, if you combine the three ingredients, you make an oxymel. And there's different ways you can do it. I just use the simplest way where I put the fruit into a jar, like a kiln in a jar. I put in honey halfway and I top it up with vinegar. 
some people heat them up and infuse them in that way. I just prefer to put them all together and leave them to sit. Mm -hmm. And um, you can just give them a little stir or a shake after a few weeks when all those nutrients have infused into the honey and vinegar and um, and, and just eat it from there. Mm. And of course, it tastes delicious because you've got the, the sweet and the sour and um, it's lovely. It's a lovely way to stay healthy over winter. Yeah, yes, indeed. And mm. about those, um, I call that the wise women way, because these are the ancient ways that we used to prepare our own medicine. And um, not so long ago, it was our daily food and our daily eating that was our medicine. Whereas, yeah, whereas right now, in the majority, the mainstream, our medicine would be pills and whatnot that we take, but then our, our, our food would not be so nourishing and they kind of contradict each other very hard. And so maybe you can speak to that where um, how we can and anybody who's listening or all of us can really reclaim that vibrant health through making our food medicine once more, which is very much the wise woman way. But also men. I mean, I don't want to put a gender on it, but it is yeah. that, you know, the woman at the hearth, the Bridget lady yes, who yeah, creates. Absolutely. Yeah. Um well I I I mean I, I, I'm a historian. Um that's what I did in college. And um so I love to look back to the past because I think we can learn so much. And I think in recent times there's a saying in English that the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater, mm. which means you're getting rid of the dirt, but you might throw something good out as well. And that's what's happened, I think, with our past. Everything's been ditched and we've, we've forgotten to retain the stuff that we, we need. So I think when we look at the cyclical living, um, different food grows at different times. And the seasonal food grows in harmony with what we need. Yeah. So we are not separate to nature, we're part of nature, we're embedded in nature, and nature provides us with what we need at different times of the year. So for example, in the winter time, we want nourishing root vegetables that are going to provide us with the energy that we need to get through the winter, and they're going to um, support our body during, during a time when we're more sedentary and we're hibernating. So they keep us warm and they keep us healthy. And then in the summer, in the warmer parts of the year, we can get the fruits, we can get the salads, we can get the greens. And in the springtime, when we're looking at the wild plants that are coming up, lots of those wild plants are very important for cleansing yeah. the system after having hibernated all winter. So I think that's where our food is our medicine. When we eat seasonally, and especially if, if it's your own food that you've grown yourself. Um, but if you can't grow it yourself, if you can get organic seasonal food, you're going to be nourishing your body as it goes through different um, seasons of the year and different, you know, we renew ourselves regularly. So we, we're constantly renewing our bodies. And um, if we eat according to the season of the year, we'll be eating the foods that the body needs at that particular time. Mm -hmm. yeah and i think every culture in the world has like uh, christians in the west would eat, would fast at lenten time mm -hmm. but the muslims fast and the jews fast we all have a time for fasting and it tends to be the same kind of time of the year because our ancestors knew that it was time to cleanse the body and to detox after the sedentary uh, ways we've had over winter mm. because we know if we are not moving and not active our lymph tends to suffer and it becomes toxic because we have to move to get the lymph system moving so the lymph is um, runs alongside the blood system but it doesn't have a pump like the heart is the pump for the blood system so we have to physically move to get the lymph flowing and the lymph is bringing um, nutrients to parts of our body and removing toxins. So if we don't move, the lymph can't really get rid of the toxins. So when we, if you imagine our ancient past, we'd be coming out of our winter hibernation, we'd be finding all these wonderful 
succulent, tasty spring greens, and we'd be starting to move. So um, we can still do that today. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And even when you were speaking there, if you do not have a garden um, and you grow your own food, we can still do wild foraging. And yeah. um, even if you live in the city and there is no Absolutely. really, yeah. because where I live, for example, in Flanders, wildness doesn't exist here. It's either um, uh, 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 lumbo. Mm, I lost the English word. Well, it's either a uh, city or agricultural land. But what we do have is these huge um, organic farms and they grow lots of food, but they do not necessarily want the weeds. So for example, these new, these, what, what we need right now, whereas dandelion is starting to root up again, nettles, these weeds that we can find all over, especially here in the Northern climate, they yeah. grow also on the organic farms where they haven't been sprayed. And oh. if you go and ask, if you may forage them from them, the people on the farm will be super happy for me, yeah. <laughs> for humans yeah. that come, yeah, clean the weeds, but we really need them. And oh. there, you also have a beautiful um, book about the weeds and reconnecting with the medicine of the weeds because this is also something that I am very strong um, strong about this where we have been calling these amazing medicinal plants weeds and exterminating them when for yes. example when it's dandelion it's so good for the liver or for food and we just poison them and get rid of them which is so weird um, so maybe you can speak to that as well and how you feel towards the weeds and working with them how yeah well I think um I I believe that everything on the planet has um a, has benefit like we we've had a rat that we had to we we trapped a rat in a humane trap and we we released it mm. and I really the idea of rats is awful, but I thought, look, there must be some good that they do. And I looked it up, and yes, they do a lot of good in nature. They aerate the soil because they burrow, they eat little pests, and they disperse seeds. So they do have some benefits, even though we don't want them in our house. So I think every plant as well, there's something to be found of benefit in every plant. And um, for me, as a herbalist, most of my herbs that I use would be wild weeds because they're so medicinal. And um, if you look at nettle, for example, that you mentioned, apart from being the, one of the most highly nutritious plants on the planet and very tasty, it's also, um, you can use the fiber to make fabric. You can make compost tea with it to help other plants to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, there's several benefits to nettle. And I think we just need to re-educate ourselves to this because people knew that in the past. Yes. It's just that our education system, when we're talking about the opposite to cyclical living, for example, to me, education is this narrow, narrow corridor that you just have to go straight along and you can't, you can't veer off to see, well, what's over here and what's over there? And it's a narrow corridor with one purpose which is to force people to fit into into some kind of um i don't know society a matrix whatever whereas and so a lot of the natural learning people would have had um has gone yeah you know so my father for example grew up around here and he would have just run wild as a child so he was much much and in those days they were barefoot Mm. Um, because Ireland had only just achieved independence and it was a very, very poor country. So um, the farmers that lived around here were subsistence farmers and they were also fishermen. So they were pretty much self-sufficient. Um, so they were much closer to the land, much closer to nature, and they were much more observant because they weren't distracted with televisions mm. and computer games and smartphones. They might... The children in his time might spend hours just watching um, a goose nest to see whether the gosling's going to hatch out. So, so I think, yeah, so that kind of natural education would have just happened, but it's kind of forced out of people now with this very narrow, constricted yes. corridor of life. 
Yeah, that's one of the things that I find incredibly sad is that what in Belgium, at least what, what they do often with the kids, because kids are not meant to sit eight hours on a bench listening and, and getting <laughs> all this information, mental information thrown at them. And then having 15 minutes to walk on a, on the stone yard. That's not what kids are made. No human is made to do that. But what, what saddens me very much is that these kids often are put on relatin um yes. like a kind of drug that calms them but the issue is not that they are hyperactive the issue is like you say the structure that is completely yeah. against the natural ways of human yeah. and getting kids out of the classroom out of that yeah that that that, that sterile environment almost and getting them back into the wild can help so much mm. i remember um a mother once her child was diagnosed with HDHD and he, she needed to put her child on relative, but she says, no, he's just very active. And then she sent him to play rugby mm. three times a week or so. And mm -hmm. he was completely fine. Just having that sport to channel his energy yes. into was enough. And it strengthened him, made him like his muscles develop yes. in a good way. And these are the things that together with going out in nature and kind of uh, discovering our inner wildness, because as you said, we are nature. We're not separate from it. We, mm -hmm. We're not some outside observer. We are in the midst of it and reclaiming that state of humans where we naturally are part of it that is very important right now in these times i, I feel so. yeah it's really sad isn't it children are meant to be full of energy mm -hmm. and then it's squashed down it's awful yeah and like you say naturally cur curious yes and spending hours to watch if the ed eggs will hatch yeah yeah there's such a natural curiosity that they have mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, I remember when I was a child, I lived in this town and we didn't have a garden. And my dad, I don't know where he got it from, but he, he, he found a cricket, a, a little cricket, and he showed us if you tap the back of the cricket, it would hop. And then he tied a little piece of cotton thread onto the cricket's leg. So that when, it, when we watched it hop, it wasn't getting away and we could, we could observe it for longer. And I just remember it was so incredible to see a creature that was small. And normally you might be scared of it because it's a, an insect, but it was so interesting to see it close up on his hand. And, um, and I just thought he, that's probably what he did as a kid. He'd be playing with crickets and all sorts of creatures. Yeah. And it's gone now. Mm. Well, I don't feel it's completely gone, but it has for the majority. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's why these types of podcasts and the work that you do and the work that we all do and parents saying no to doctors proposing yeah. relative, those might seem like small steps, but they are huge and they're weaving the web back between us yeah. and nature. And I think there's a lot of parents opting for forest schools as well. Yes. Do you have them all there? Um, or well, The concept for a school is new to me, but but maybe, so can you explain a bit about what that is? Um, I think it's because a lot of people are realizing that the education system doesn't actually prepare children for life. Mm. You know, no, I mean, children nowadays, they fasten their shoes with Velcro instead of learning how to tie a lace. Really? A lot, most children's shoes have Velcro fasteners. They don't have laces. Okay. And so they're just not learning any practical skills. Mm. And when they leave home, I mean, kids here, they leave home, they go to university, they bring their washing back to their mothers at the weekend. They don't even know how to wash their own clothes. Obviously, I'm generalizing, lots of them will know how to do it, but a lot of them, too many don't. So parents are beginning to homeschool mm -hmm. and um, as a way to get their children together with other children, these forest schools are popping up, which are basically outdoor classrooms. Mm -hmm in a woodland or in the fields and um, the children are learning practical skills, maybe, you know, collecting um, medicinal plants or collecting nuts and berries, or mm. they might make something like a spoon, do a bit of spoon carving or something, do tying ropes. I don't know for sure because I'm, my children are all grown up now, but um, this is what I've heard. So it's wonderful that these little things are popping up. 
Yeah, indeed. And as you were speaking, I, I was also reflecting on for adults now as well. And mm -hmm. well, you are one example of it. I'm another where really we go back out into the well into nature but we really reconnect and learn about like you say medicinal harvesting and creating that medicines in the yeah. oak way and can you speak a little bit about that about creating your own medicinal medicine kit your own apothecary and how one would go about it if they wanted to start and taking more of that into their own hands well yeah i think that um as i was saying earlier about the children they're, they're born and they follow this very narrow corridor of life and then they then they die they grow up and they die you know without these excursions into the rest of the world mm -hmm. so um if you so so i think that making your medicine is one of those diversions mm -hmm. and it's reclaiming your power because our power has been handed over to teachers to doctors to corporations and none of them have our best interests at heart. So I think anything you can do to reclaim your own power and making your own medicine is one of those things. And the simplest thing you can do is to eat well, make sure your diet is seasonal and organic. Um, and the next best thing you can do is to just collect plants that you can use for tea and just pour the boiling water on and drink it. You have to let it stand for about 15 to 20 minutes to actually create a medicinal tea rather than just a beverage. Um, then you could dry the things that you like. You could dry it for use over winter. Um, so just simple things that you might even grow for cooking. So basil, oregano, marjoram, um, lemon balm, mint, all of those things that you might use in your cooking, you can make a tea with as well and enjoy it for various um, health issues. So then you could dry those plants. You could find out which plants in the wild, such as the dandelion, the nettles, plantain. Mm. Um, there's loads of other plants that are, there's just too many to mention because depending whether you're near a meadow or a woodland or waste ground. So cities have tons of wildflowers and wild medicinal plants. The most common one is probably um fireweed or rose bay willow herb mm, yeah. um, it's very tall mm. beautiful little pink flowers and the leaves are just like willow leaves mm -hmm. so um that's very medicinal as well um purple loose strife tends to grow along railways and anywhere the soil has been disturbed again a very beneficial plant for respiratory issues so once you've learned to just identify those plants, mm -hmm. you can start using them. And the simplest thing to do is to make a tea or you could make um, a tincture. So you're putting your plant material into a jar and covering it with vodka. 40% proof um, is strong enough to extract the, cons the healing constituents of the plants. Mm. So... Um, yeah. What else could you do? You can make salves and balms. Yeah, and they're all surprisingly easy. Yes. They make it sound so difficult, especially if you go into the store and you look at the ingredients of salves. But the, those ingredients are actually not... I had one friend tell me once, anything that you put on your skin needs to be something that you can eat and yes. won't get sick of. And if yes. you would yes. not eat it, don't put it in. Not that it would be tasty. If you make a bowl, oh, exactly. it would be tasty, but you wouldn't get sick of it. You wouldn't oh. digest it and it would be fine. Um, okay. Yeah. So, and that stayed with me because it was also so easy to remember. And yeah. when I started to create my own bombs and my own oils and salves and for massages and whatnot, I yeah. just noticed how easy it is. Very easy. It's very hard to mess up. Oh. <laughs> Very hard even, to get it wrong. even if it doesn't look perfect, you could still use it. You could still use it. And it will still probably be a lot better than um, stuff you can buy in the store. Because, for example, yeah. making soap yourself, oh, so man. easy, so cheap, Literally. like so cheap to do. And the skin, you can feel it. It is so nourishing for your skin and for your or for your hair. Whereas with the bought stuff, it kind of I can feel it after the skin is dry and irritated. Oh, the smell of them as well is horrible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm, food yeah. 
Mm -hmm. so i love i love that as well reclaiming that power what you said there that anything that we can reclaim back to ourselves is it's very empowering and that's what i feel as well with that medicine making Mm -hmm. i think um i think there's so much sterility in modern life Mm -hmm. Uh, and when you start messing around in the kitchen making medicine or making your body care everywhere gets a bit messy um (laughs) Obviously, it's still clean, but there's a mess, which is a glorious mess because you're creating something. Mm -hmm. And I think women, we are natural creators. And and even if people don't have their own children, you can garden and that brings something to life or you can make something and it comes to life. Your idea comes to life. So I think the more creative we can be is another way of getting back to maybe not a cyclical type of living, but a curvaceous Mm. kind of living when you have your peaks and troughs of creativity Mm. it's that curvaceous aspect of life which is again like the earth our earth mother is curvaceous yeah yes and also i feel it would help a lot of people feel a sense of purpose again because Mm. many people have also lost their sense of purpose and sense of pride but the healthy pride Um, where I remember also this one person and he was feeling very low, but he was watching TikToks all day. Well, back then, I don't think it was TikTok, but, you know, something like that, right? Watching these little videos all day round on YouTube or, I mean, not 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 the not the teaching videos on youtube but the the silly ones which can be fine it can be nice to do it but if you do it a whole day or that's what you do then you don't create nothing so you won't feel that sense of accomplishment afterwards where if you created something and it might not be super nice but more often than not it will be just a beautiful and unique and restore the value in that then yeah, it also it's really meditative. restores our own worth yeah a meditative process as well yes definitely i, I don't like are. meditation like sitting still and silent yeah. i don't really like it but put me in the garden yeah, yeah. And, and i'll be in a happy happens. zone yeah. <laughs> yeah i think i think you've touched on something there because you know depression is going through the roof apparently lots of people are depressed and i'm thinking if you're going out and you're just handing money over for things and you bring them home, mm-hmm. you've no connection to them, you know. So it's like when I go into the supermarket and I see you can buy um, a tray of food that's already prepared, so the vegetables have been cut and chopped. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. they've lost all their nutritional value. But it's the same with clothing, it's the same with anything. You know, if you do a little bit of sewing or knitting or craft work, it's it does lift your mood. You've been creative and you've got something tangible to show for your time. Mm-hmm. And and when you're talking about your friend on TikTok, I've noticed that uh, people follow hundreds of people on Instagram, but but why aren't they doing something themselves? You know, they mm-hmm. they admire these people because they're doing whatever. But why don't you do something? Yeah. Instead of spending all your time just following everybody else, you know, just do it yourself. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> that could be a quote of the <laughs> of the podcast. Yes, definitely. And it is it's, it's very easy and to learn something, we're so quick to pick up something new and if we have the heart and the desire, anything else it just flows right naturally and it can be gardening, it can be tending um a plant like you say from seed all the way up to an adult plant and then when you eat that tomato or so it might only yield three tomatoes but those will be the best tasting tomatoes you will ever have eaten in your life definitely (laughs) yeah um something i also wanted to ask you because she's been mentioned a couple of times is about the goddess bridget um because i know you work with her closely and as uh we are now recording this um episode just before in bulk which is known as her festival so i really wanted to weave her in this episode and can you share a little bit about uh Imbolc and Bridget, the okay. goddess um, or saint, I mean, whomever you work with. Well, I work with the goddess. Um, the goddess Bridget is, she's a goddess of peace, I think, because um, if you go back to ancient Irish history, the Tuatha de Danann were ruling 
and then the Fomorians came and they there were lots of there were two major battles but um after the first battle um there was um what you call it like there was a pax they made peace and they decided to do power sharing so the Fomorian king ruled first and he was married to Bridget. Mm. Um, so when they were making peace, there was some intermarriage and Bridget married Brez, who was a Fomorian king, and he ruled first. But when everything broke down again, their son decided to fight on the Fomorian side against Bridget's people. So when he was killed in battle, she cried and she was the first person to keen the dead. Mm. So in Ireland, there's a tradition of keening. And it would be in other cultures as well. It's where women cry and wail. They put ash on their face. They pull their hair. And keening in Ireland is a particular kind of sound. So she invented that. So I think that because, um, because of the way the war between the two peoples um, occurred and then they made peace again, and came to a decision that the Tuatha de Danann would hide into the would live in the hills, and in the land. Um, I see her as a goddess of peace, but apart from that, she's also a goddess of fire, because she is when the sun kind of returns at springtime. She's the young maiden who brings life back to the earth. She's also a triple goddess because she um, rules over hearth and home. She, she's a creative muse for poets and um, she also brings the fire. So she brings the fire of inspiration to poets and she's also the inspiration for the blacksmith. Mm. So some people think it meant she was a blacksmith, but she wasn't. In ancient times, somebody who was smithing, whether they were make, making iron or silver or gold, they were seen to have a magical or supernatural talent. And so Bridget is the flame of that type of inspiration. So apart from being a goddess of the element of fire and, you know, we link her to the sun because her cross is very much like um, a swastika. Um, she's also in control or oversees all the holy wells and the water element. So, all the holy wells would be under her protection. And um, so she's also a goddess of healing and midwifery. And when we think of midwifery, it's birthing a baby, but it could also be birthing a wonderful idea or a wonderful poem or a beautiful piece of jewellery or a sword or whatever. So um, she's kind of just amazing in that she covers so much. Yeah, definitely. I uh, just went over at the winter solstice to Ireland and I visited Kildare, where yes. uh, the Saint Bridget uh, lived. So in there, there are two aspects. You have the goddess Bridget, which is very this ancient, like you, you just talked about. And then there's also the saint, which is a Catholic woman or was it Catholic back then? No, it was Christian, Christian woman, yes. probably, um, yes. who would either received the title Bridget or was named Bridget, something like that. And she uh, started a monastery in Kildare and that still there are some remnants from that. But when I was there and I talked to the nuns, the Bridgetines, yeah. uh, whom are still five or so, they're still um, keeping the flame or they relit the flame yes. of Bridget. Yes. yes. And we spoke to one. And what I love about that Bridget energy is that to me, to Bridget, it really doesn't matter how it looks like, what it is, as long as the spirit is there, like that inner fire is there, that's I all know. that matters. And to me, Bridget is a very much an activist as well. When yeah. you say in the times of war, she was a great uniter because she stood for that peace. And right now as well, you have these nuns, right? <laughs> Christian nuns who are speaking up against um, all the arms that are being made and they are comparing all the money that is being sent to create arms mm. uh, weapons and mm. then comparing that with all the money that is needed to feed the mm. hunger the the hungry 
and yeah. and then you see like the balance is totally out of luck and that is so much in Bridget's her energy is to yeah. stand for these things and to not fear where she might step on some toes because mm -hmm. of that fire that inner fire for justice as well that's definitely yeah. but I from that deep love mm. Mm. yeah she yeah. is um she's very powerful and she would encourage um so when we celebrate in bulk here we would imagine the sun at the solar plexus mm -hmm. um radiating through the body and giving us that warrior spirit Oh. But in a, in not a warrior that goes out to battle, but a warrior that holds the peace. Mm. Two different aspects of the warrior. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think it's an ancient uh, Japanese or martial arts quote where I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, but I'll be a little bit because it's, it's, it's very far in my mind. But it is yeah. about um, a true warrior learns how to fight to hold the peace, not to go to war. And that is something that right now, well, at least if we work with Bridget, that's what we need. And that's for me personally, that has been also my turning point where before I would be spending a lot of time with um, very left winged feminist and anti-fascist. But it was still of that anger that was at the yeah, front, like, yeah. exactly, rah, stand our ground and fuck the system. And yes, fuck the system. But what are you creating? And that brings it back to that um, Instagram thing that you said, you're following so many people for me that I was spraying judgment on so many politicians. But what would I what was I doing? I wasn't doing yeah. anything. So <laughs> And there, Bridget is very much about come within and see what you can do, but take up your sleeves and, and get your hands dirty and dig into that earth and don't be scared to put some mud on your trousers. <laughs> Definitely, I think so. And because she was such an, because she carries this flame of inspiration for the poets and for the Smiths and for the woman who's creative in the home, um, it is all about creation. What can you create from within? Yeah. Mm. Yes, beautiful. And so in bulk approaching, what could be a very beautiful ritual to do for people to celebrate that inner warrior, sun, fire energy within them and also outside in the earth that is returning, at least for those in the Northern Hemisphere, because obviously Southern Hemisphere is the other way around, but they can come back to this episode when they're oh, <laughs> at that time. Um well, Imolk itself is a word that could mean in the belly of the ewe. So the, all the ewes now are pregnant with their baby lambs. Yeah. So it just reminds us this is the time of year when winter is over, the animals have um, been carrying their babies and they're about to deliver. So it's that wonderful time. And one of the things we can do for Bridget is to offer white meat which is the cheeses and the milks and all the products that we would get from the sheep because they're now coming into milk because they're having their baby lambs. But another interpretation of Imolk is um, it's about purifying and cleansing yourself. So we would light a candle to cleanse the darkness. We would eat these lovely medicinal plants that are coming up, the spring greens to, to cleanse ourselves. Um, so to me, Imolk is about cleansing, purification, renewal, lighting the candle in the dark to bring more light. And um, the way we would celebrate it here is we make, uh, we make a new cross, a Bridget's cross, mm -hmm. because they would last, each cross would bring protection for a year. And I make little Bridogs, they're little dolls from the Russias. And then we would celebrate Bridget by maybe doing something creative because she is such a creative force. So we might write a poem or a chant about her or about the season. And um, we would have a bonfire if it's a dry day. And um, the other thing we do is to put out... Um, a gift of cheese, cheeses and milk. Mm -hmm. For the fairies. <laughs> yeah, we'd lay them out for the fairies. Um, yeah. yeah. It's an Beautiful. opportunity to get together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was, uh, when you sp spoke about creating those 
dolls and the cross of inbox and and anyone who wants to do it i would definitely guide them to your uh channel your youtube channel because you have both on those you have a little yes. video explaining yeah. how to do it which is yeah. quite helpful to see and you can follow it step by step yeah, yeah. it was lovely because when i did the video for the little bridogs bridogs we call them um a few people sent me what they had made, sent me oh. photographs, and they were just beautiful. And it was so lovely to hear from mothers who were doing it with their daughters, doing it as a little family, girly thing to do together. Mm -hmm. And just before I forget, another thing we do for Bridget is her... She, in terms of the saint, it's believed that she travels around Ireland the night before. So the Celtic day begins at dusk, Mm -hmm. and goes through the 24 hours until the next dusk. So all the cross-quarter days begin on the night before. Yeah. So Bridget's day is the 1st of February, so it starts at dusk on the 31st of January. Mm -hmm. So that's Bridget's Eve. And we would leave the hearth nice and clean so that she can come and we smoor the fire, which means you would leave... Um, cover the fire so it keeps burning but it's not burning 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 it just keeps alive so she can get warm and you may even leave a little bed next to the fire so she can have a nap mm -hmm. you know that's old-fashioned hospitality from the olden times mm -hmm. that yes. you would do as part of your celebration yeah. as well and that this is where all these um stories and these practices it can be incredibly fun to do with the kids and so but they all have a significant effect on us on the long term within us because it's in storing these old values like you say that we really want to restore once more which is hospitality which is sharing which is coming together and sharing a good poem a good story a good laugh and there's that warmth that we also bring to each other mm, i love it i love it yeah <laughs> amazing all right so that brings me to my last question and that is something that I ask everyone because I, I really love what the answer like the creativity uh, that comes out of it and that is um, I ask everyone to paint a picture on how they'd imagine the world would look like if everybody was living in a cyclical way oh wow well, it'd be wonderful wouldn't it um, <laughs> I think that we've reached a point now where things are just so linear, they're becoming dystopian. Um, <laughs> Saudi Arabia are planning to, have you seen this? This new city, Saudi Arabia, it's going to be, um, it's going to house 9 million people and it's going to be a long, long 17 miles or 17 kilometers long and only so wide. Okay, just a line. It's just a line. It's it's a linear city, and it's look it up. It's horrific. <laughs> I think it's horrific. But I think if we could go back to cyclical living, I think we would have much more balance. I think in cyclical living, there's a role for men and there's a role for women, and um, you know, when you mentioned your feminist. Um, friends earlier um obviously feminism is important but when it becomes so radical that it's actually denying a woman's rights to be a mother for example that is ridiculous i think mm. so i think cyclical living will really celebrate all the aspects of life which is birth which is pregnancy birth um looking after the children of the tribe of the clan of the community looking after the elders as they get more feeble and vulnerable and um we and also what i think is really important is that we get into nature to really appreciate and um revere it mm. and i was thinking when we look i don't look at any mainstream media but i know most of the news is bad whereas imagine if on the news the headline story was a stump in the forest is kept alive because the other trees channel food to it. Wow, imagine if everybody knew that. Imagine if all the kids heard that in school. Mm. It would really make you look differently. And 
what's happening to nature now is it's having a monetary value put on it and people are talking about oh you know a sister sitka spruce plantation is worth x euros um an ancient oak tree is worth x euros this river is worth x euros you know we shouldn't be putting monetary value on things we should just be appreciating and loving and i think if we went back to cyclical living and we we celebrated those seasons and those festivals i think we'd have much more peace and much more pleasure and much more personal satisfaction and fulfillment mm. yeah i agree it can definitely to me i hear as well the best of both worlds where we can have that beautiful things that technology and whatnot offers us but we also have these ancient values that weave as and hold us together in that warmth and in that um like you say harmony and balance yeah and going back to what you were saying about uh, hands in the earth and mud on the trousers <laughs> yeah. you know i i think tech we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't have incredible technology and i'm really grateful because it's really enhanced my life providing you keep it as a tool instead of something that dominates your life mm. but i it really upsets me to see farmers using technology drones and things why not get into the field and plant the yeah. plant mm. why not go into the field and smell the earth and touch the plants and harvest them instead of it all being left to machinery and technology yes. um there are two references that come to mind well the first being vandana shiva do you know her yeah 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 yes, a lady yes. from india who is very very at the front of that um yes. resistance against um the yeah militization of farming is what i call it because basically that's what you do you you're turning farming into a military if that, yes. that's what they're doing um and so she is so such an incredible woman to look at on on that work and not her alone of course she's a whole team no. <laughs> so many people behind her but a second that comes to mind is um well there's one guy in the series times of the sixth sun do you know that one yes uh, Times of the Sixth Sun. This is a series where they've interviewed elders from all over the world. The Druid High Chief Philip Gargon was uh, also interviewed. Um, but there is one man, I can't remember his name, but there he really explains about the value of farming and putting your hands in the seeds. And when we do that more, when we get more in touch with farming and creating our food we also restore that inner sense of abundance and that the world is giving because if you take one seed as you say you keep wow. the seed you, yeah. you take one you take care of it you tend it you learn how to grow it and how to harvest this, it well and then let it go over into seed you have so many seeds oh my God, from I know. one so that multiplying that's not even it's not one plus one yeah. it's two yeah no it's yeah. much more Mm -hmm. yeah, and so um, that can definitely be restored yeah. yeah have you seen the film kiss the ground no i love oh. the title <laughs> it's incredible because it is the, the 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 solution to all our problems today is so simple it's just looking after the soil and and putting animals back on this on the land we're being told at the moment we've got to take them off because of climate warming, but actually put more on um, because that's the way it's supposed to be. Mm. So um, it's a beautiful film and beautifully narrated by Woody Harrelson. And um, I would just recommend it to everybody because yeah. it, it's so eye opening. Amazing. The simplicity of the solution. Yes. Yes. And that's, that's to me what cyclical living is all about. Yes. To me, that is one of the big solutions to the many problems that we face, whether that be it within ourselves, connection, health, whatnot, but also outside mm. um, the environment and community. It's really mm. coming back to those ancient cycles of life, death and rebirth, which yeah. weaves this episode back to its beginning, which is always lovely how that happens. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if the listeners want to connect with you, where can they find you, dear Terry? Um, they can find me at Danu's Irish Herb Garden, which is the name of my website and the YouTube channel. And I'm on Instagram as yeah. well. 
Mm, all of them will be linked. And for the resources, I also like to link them below or write them down below for people that you don't have to write it down because I always find that hard when I'm listening to podcasts. Oh, yes. <laughs> so there will be referenced as well. All right. Thank you so much for joining. Well, thank um, you for having me. It's been lovely to have a chat just unexpectedly out of the blue. It's great. Yes, indeed. All right. Mm, blessed be. I want to thank you for listening to this episode, my love. If you feel inspired to work with me on a deeper level, then I invite you to check out my offers on my website, wildrosemysteryschool.com or through Instagram where you can find me as deuce.sarah. And for now, sending you 